I want to dedicate this episode to a fan, Sherry Denise McGee Wallace Masters, who left us last month. She will be missed. The Islamic community has long had to deal with a constant litany of hate crimes being directed towards them. It doesn't matter if it's the 2017 Finsbury Park attack in England, the 2019 Christchurch mosque shooting in New Zealand, or any of the countless other incidents which were inflicted upon Muslims in the wake of 9-11 in the U.S. Accepting that some people would rather see you dead than alive has become a sad daily reality for those who follow the faith. Canada had been relatively free of major Islamophobic attacks, but in 2021 that would all change when a young man was driven by hatred to carry out the unthinkable. This is Monsters. To the outside world, Nathaniel Veltman seemed like a pretty average 20-year-old. Born on December 20, 2000, the son of middle-class parents Mark Veltman and Alicia Bissett not only had a steady job working at an egg-packing factory at the time of his arrest, but he also kept his own apartment in the Covent Marketplace area of downtown London, Ontario. As for his personal interests, while those varied, the majority of his time was devoted to his Christian faith, a faith he'd gotten from his parents, both of whom were devout in what many would refer to as fundamentalist. Their beliefs were on the more extreme side, and they donated to a variety of right-wing causes during Nathaniel's youth, including but not limited to anti-abortion groups and organizations that advocated for a number of different socially conservative policies. Obviously, then, that made a big effect on Nathaniel in terms of shaping both his own personality and sense of morality. It would actually lead him to go several steps further than his parents when, at the age of 13, he gave serious consideration to killing an abortion doctor as he'd come to believe that doctor was acting against the will of God. Thankfully, though, he came to his senses and would not go ahead with any of his plans. Instead, he pushed the thoughts to the back of his mind and focused on his schooling instead. Schooling that was administered by his parents from their southwestern Ontario home. Yes, Nathaniel, along with not only his four younger siblings, but also his twin sister Alicia, were all homeschooled for the majority of their youth. With that seeing them get a narrower understanding of the world than most on account of their parents only wanting to teach them in the fundamentalist ways they believed. Not that such an education appeared to do the boy any harm during his younger days as far as the outside world was concerned as, despite his internal feelings about certain issues and people, by all accounts he was a very happy child, someone who had a particular love of animals. Even when he was eventually taken away from the world of homeschooling and thrown into the deep end of the traditional high school experience in September of 2016, he appeared to adapt to the situation without much difficulty. In fact, after his parents decided to enroll him at the Strathroy District Collegiate Institute for the last two years of his education, he was able to do well during his final exams. He actually managed to graduate with a scholarship that was supposed to help him with post-secondary education funding. Sure, he was a quiet kid who didn't seem to have a lot of luck making friends, and some of his peers thought him to be more than a little eccentric. But considering he hadn't been around other children his age for much of his life prior to that, it was understandable. It wasn't as if he was hurting anybody. No, the worst anyone had to say about him came when one of his classmates described him as being odd. Someone who had something undeniably off about him. At this point in the story, then, you'd be forgiven for thinking Nathaniel's life was going to carry on in a completely normal manner with him heading on to college, all while maintaining a close relationship with both his family and faith. But what few realized at the time was that things were about to be upended for the youngster in a major way as his parents were about to undergo a messy divorce. His family life was not as rosy as it seemed in the Veltman household. Rather, parents Mark and Alicia had long been at each other's throats, and the discord between them had by then even managed to include their children, too. 
That was because Nathaniel and his siblings had become little more than tools to be used in their folks' ongoing war as they each tried to turn their family against the other. At one point, during a text exchange, the boy's father would even tell him, quote, I'm sorry I can't see you tonight. I'm not feeling well. Being on the receiving end of your mother's relentless mission to utterly destroy me has that effect. So obviously then, the couple couldn't continue to remain together for much longer. And that was why, soon thereafter, Alicia formally filed for divorce. The divorce had a profoundly negative effect on the children, especially as given the bitter hatred which now existed between Mark and Alicia. Their offspring felt like they were being forced to choose a side. And it appears Nathaniel ultimately chose his father's side as, after his mother was granted sole custody of all six children on account of her husband's history of extramarital affairs, he grew increasingly distant from her. Where once there had been a very loving and close relationship, now there was only anger from a boy who had come to believe his dad's side of the story. A side that argued that Alicia was to blame for the disillusion of their family unit. So frosty did things get, in fact, at times she would take to locking herself in her bedroom in order to avoid her son. With her reasoning being that she knew if she tried to engage with him, he'd only be argumentative and complain about the fact his father was being forced to pay so much in child support. The way Nathaniel saw it, Mark should no longer be responsible for financially supporting the family if he was no longer going to be living with them. No, instead, he felt Alicia should quit homeschooling altogether and get a paying job which would allow her to put food on the table for them. Of course, much of that way of thinking had been very clearly instilled in the boy by his father, but that didn't make the arguments any less valid in his mind. No, his father was obviously someone he idolized, so why wouldn't he think he was the one who was right in this situation? He was certainly right when it came to recognizing that their mother was being too strict with the children's upbringing and that keeping such tight restrictions on what they could and couldn't do was going to lead them growing even more bitter and resentful of her. Nathaniel would become so bitter and resentful as soon as he reached 16 years old, the legal age of adulthood in Canada, he left home and had very little to do with his mother afterwards. And it was then, now finally out from under the iron grasp of his parents, that he began to get a wider range of social experiences, with them including coming into contact with people from other cultures and religions for the first time. Not that he'd hold those people in very high regard, though, as, according to one co-worker he shared a job with at the egg-packing factory, Nathaniel was prone to making highly racist comments about black people, something the co-worker had to warn him against at one point. Was his attitude a result of his fundamentalist upbringing? Did they come from a shared bigotry his parents held? Or were they just inherent beliefs he had about the world? It's impossible to say. But whatever the reason, there were clearly a lot of issues Nathaniel had with those who he deemed to be different to him, particularly those of a different race. And those weren't the only fringe opinions he'd held by that point either, as he'd also begun to get interested in conspiracy theory culture, with some of his favorite theories being that the Earth was flat and that a group of reptilian humanoids were secretly controlling the world. <sighs> On top of that, Nathaniel was also struggling to deal with his sense of morality as he was going through what he felt were impure sexual desires. Desires that he often sought to quench by viewing online pornography. Of course, given his strict Christian upbringing, he believed watching that material was nothing less than an affront to God and so he was desperate to stop by any means necessary. In fact, on one occasion, such desperation to stop even led him to attempting to cut off his own testicles, an incident which left him hospitalized. Clearly, there was a lot going on in Nathaniel's head and, in a different world, he probably would have benefited greatly from undergoing therapy. But that wasn't the world he chose to exist in, and instead his form of therapy ended up being to bury himself in a bottle, drinking more and more and at various points finding himself being fined by the police for public intoxication. Still, even if he was falling apart from the inside, he was at least able to maintain not only his employment, but his higher education too as, in September of 2018, after graduating from school, he began studying architectural drafting at Fanshawe College. 
while that may never have been enough to divorce him from some of his more fringe attitudes entirely. Being around more open and reasonably minded people his age might have been enough to stop him from delving deeper down that rabbit hole. At least it might have if a global pandemic hadn't happened. Unfortunately, in 2020, that's exactly what took place, and so, now isolated from others once more due to the necessity of a lockdown, Nathaniel's worst instincts were able to take hold of him again as he sunk further and further into the world of conspiratorial beliefs. That saw him get heavily involved in things like anti-lockdown rallies as he came to believe the whole pandemic was nothing more than a new way for the elites to control the masses. Of course, it wasn't just conspiracies about the pandemic that took hold of his mind at that point, though. No, as the lockdown went on and Nathaniel spent more and more time sitting in his computer digging into forums filled with people who shared similar interests as he did, he became more and more radicalized in terms of his stance that non-white, non-Christian people were to blame for so many of the world's problems. Of the groups who were to blame for these problems, perhaps none were worse, at least in his mind, than Muslims. After all, based on the information he was taking in, those who followed Islam were little more than terror-loving fanatics who were coming to overthrow the Christian way of life. And that was what led him to begin creating a manifesto. Now, as far as I can remember, very few good things have come at the conclusion of a good old-fashioned manifesto writing session, and Nathaniel wasn't poised to break that record. His manifesto would outline his plan or what he saw as a white awakening in the world where the Caucasian population would soon rise up to reclaim the world that was rightfully theirs, straight from the hands of others such as black people, Jews, and perhaps most importantly, Muslims. Not that anyone else around him knew he was writing a racist manifesto. While his opinions on the politics of the day were becoming increasingly obvious, the fact that Nathaniel was creating a plan calling for a white uprising was news to even those who were closest to him. One person who had grown close to the young man during the pandemic, a fellow campaign volunteer at the Christian Heritage political party he was involved in, would be shocked to find that information out following the events of June 6, 2021. Sure, he could clearly see Nathaniel was someone who was lost in life and in desperate need of guidance, but he had no idea his mind had already gone as far as it had. All the anonymous friend could see when they looked at the boy was someone who needed a friend and mentor to get them back on track. Which is exactly why he began acting as that then, regularly inviting Daniel over to his house to have dinner with his family. But while that may have helped him for a while, eventually he started pulling away from his new friend, growing more and more isolated with each passing day. And when it was suggested he go live with his family, Nathaniel rejected the idea outright even as he was paradoxically sending emails to them in which he complained of his loneliness and isolation. In fact, it was in one of those emails that he would actually show the first signs of the rage building up in him, which would soon lead to a tragedy when he said, quote, I feel so isolated from my family and my soul doesn't even seem to understand the reason why I'm on this earth. I feel full of resentment, anger, hatred, and rage against the world and some people. I got on my knees in the bathroom today and asked God to save me from myself. I told him that I knew my heart was filled with pride and I asked him to take it away from me. Walking away, I feel empowered and I feel like God is lifting me out of my mental torment. After praying, I felt reminded that I was on this earth to serve God and not myself. How would the man trying to guide him back down the right path react to such concerning admissions? Well, he encouraged him to listen to more Christian music and establish better daily routines as he felt that was the true way back towards God and away from his pain. Once he had done that, he also insisted that Nathaniel join him and his family for Christmas that year. But while Nathaniel would initially agree, in the end he cancelled, with his excuse being that he didn't have enough money to fix the broken windshield on his car and get over there as he'd maxed out his credit card long before that. Was that the real reason he didn't attend? It's possible, but given the fact he had enough money to buy a new car just a few months later, it seems unlikely. Rather, it's more probable Nathaniel simply wasn't interested in getting help from that family anymore as they weren't telling him what he wanted to hear. 
No, what he wanted to hear appeared to be less that life could be better by seeking God, and more that life could be better by eradicating those who angered him. And it wasn't just him who he felt should be taking part in the eradication process either, as the discovery of his A White Awakening manifesto would later prove. He wanted to inspire others to rise up and fight back against those who he perceived to be encroaching upon his culture too. That was exactly why he began doing things like researching the likelihood of a pedestrian being injured or dying should they be hit by a car at various speeds. On top of that, he also started looking into the previously mentioned Christchurch shooting in New Zealand where a white supremacist had killed 51 people in a mosque in 2019, with him trying to figure out then how the shooter had committed the massacre so effectively and what he could learn from it. Then, as if that wasn't enough evidence, he was planning something terrible. He also ordered a bulletproof vest and military-style helmet from an online store. Clearly, Nathaniel knew he was going to do something soon, though as things grew closer to that fateful day, he still wasn't sure exactly what it would be. Would it be another mosque attack as had happened in New Zealand? Or would it be something different like running some cops over with his new 2016 Ram 1500? Something he'd joked about with a friend after buying the vehicle. <laughs> Hilarious. Whatever the plan, the car seemed to be a big part of it, at least according to Michael Arntfield, a University of Western Ontario criminology professor and former London police officer who later argued that it was clear the boy had purchased a big sturdy vehicle like this for the sole reason it would allow him to maximize the casualties. And as it turned out, that vehicle would help him do just that, as, after months of waiting for the right moment to strike, Nathaniel Veltman finally carried out the crime that would see him forever go down in infamy on June 6, 2021. After ingesting a large quantity of magic mushrooms, the by now fully radicalized young man got in his truck and set off on a drive to a nearby store in order to pick up some food. On the way there, while headed down Hyde Park Road at around 8.40 p.m., he spotted a family of Muslims walking along the sidewalk. So realizing this was the time, and what he later described as a momentary urge, he did a U-turn, sped up, mounted the sidewalk, and hit them all at full speed. As one witness would later describe it, Nathaniel's truck started speeding down the road so fast that at one point the force of it actually shook her own vehicle. And when the impact happened, it happened at such a velocity that the victims who were waiting to cross the road at the South Carriage Road intersection were sent flying 30 to 40 feet, or 10 to 12 meters. The victims were a family made up of three separate generations who had emigrated to Canada 14 years prior, with their numbers including Father Salman Afsal, a 46-year-old psychotherapist, his wife, Madiha Salman, a 44-year-old engineering student, their children, 15-year-old Yumna Salman and 9-year-old Fayez Afzal, and Salman's mother, 74-year-old Talat Afzal. The Afzals were a family well-known in not only the local London Muslim community, but also the community in general. In fact, Salman had been very active in a number of different areas there over the years. Areas such as sports, care for the elderly, and of course his local mosque. To those who knew him, he was a gentle soul, the kind of person who always smiled and greeted others when he saw them on the street, and who always went out of his way to help those most in need. As one of the residents at Ritz Lutheran Villa Nursing Home, where he often worked, put it, quote, He worked with hundreds, probably thousands, of our moms and dads and grandparents. You lose somebody with that kind of dedication to seniors, it just triples the impact. And Salman wasn't the only member of the family who was beloved by those around him either, as Madiha, someone who was in the midst of completing her PhD at London's Western University at the time of the attack, was also a figure of praise. To the kids in the area, she was someone who regularly arranged events which attempted to help educate them on things like science, math, and engineering. And to the adults, she was a person who always liked to feed people she knew with big platters of traditional Pakistani rice and chicken whenever the opportunity arose. Then there was Talat, the eldest of the family. In the aftermath of the attack, she was described as an integral part of the London Muslim community. And when it came to the kids, Yumna and Fayez, well, they had all the promise in the world. 
Yuna was already an honor roll student at school despite her young age. So to see her be cut down so early in life, it was a true tragedy, even if her brother was able to survive. Yes, there was a lone survivor of the incident, and it was Fayez. But escaping death must have felt like it was of little solace to him in the immediate aftermath as everyone else in his family had been murdered, with one dying on the scene and the other three dying soon thereafter in the hospital. As for what would become of the killer, well, he was arrested minutes after hitting the Afsals with his car. It all happened when, following the attack, he drove to a nearby mall parking lot, got out of his vehicle, then confronted a taxi driver who was on a smoke break, telling him that he had killed somebody and that the police needed to be called to come get him. Obviously then, the taxi driver called the authorities and a few minutes later they arrived on the scene to take Nathaniel in. But why was he so eager to be arrested for his crimes? Well, it appeared that was all part of his plan, as he wanted to become a martyr of sorts, someone who could inspire others to continue on with what he had started. When Nathaniel was in for questioning, the angry young man assured the investigator that he knew his rights, and this was why. I'm not planning on, on being dishonest, or how do I put it? Um, I... I, I'm going to. I basically, I'm going to be. I, I'm going to be honest about what I did. I'm not going to try to. Okay. I'm not going to be trying to. Oh, how can I get a lower sentence? Or. Okay, I appreciate that. that. Um, it's not because it's not at all bad. It's it's a. Well, I'll explain. I guess later when you when you're asking questions. But. Um. Okay. I just, like, again, I want to make sure that you have advice, you've spoken to someone, they are aware of your situation, and that you're satisfied with the advice you get. I, I'm aware that anything that I tell you can be used to make my uh, sentence uh, worse. I know that I know that if you're trying to, you know, get the least sentence or get the least whatever, your best bet is to never talk to the cop. Like, not don't talk to the cops at all without a lawyer, but that's not my intention to do. Okay. I'm not planning. I'm not planning on pleading insanity. Uh, I'm not planning on claiming that I was uh, in a psychotic state. Or I'm not. I'm. I'm I want. I want. Uh, I want the world to know why I did what I did. So I'm gonna. I'm just gonna tell you. As he explained it to investigators, once they had him in custody, he knew that what he had carried out was an act of terrorism. As he would later describe it in court, quote. I know that every major event like this is considered a terrorist attack. My understanding of a terrorist attack is, generally, politically motivated violence. That's right, the killer was making no bones about the fact that his actions were purely motivated by politics, specifically white nationalist politics. He wanted everyone to know that because he wanted everyone who looked like him to rise up and take part too. He was so overjoyed about what he'd done and what he felt it meant for the future of the white race, in fact, he was described at the time as being altogether happy, smiling, and giddy because he'd gotten exactly what he wanted out of the situation. During his interrogation, he told the detective that it all started in 2016 when he realized that the media is dishonest. Yeah, welcome to the world, kid. He claimed that the media was purposefully reporting on white on minority crime and not the other way around, and it angered him. It filled him with rage, as he put it himself. What actually made me snap and decided, and I decided I'm going to commit violence, uh, was when I think it was the Sun. I can't remember which shitlib news media it was, but basically what happened is there were two 12-year-old white girls that were kidnapped by this Muslim grooming gang in the UK somewhere. I think it was in Britain somewhere. Um, and they were, you know, 12 year old girls drugged up, brought to some house, and they're just gang raped, gang raped, gang raped, drug, drug, drug. And their, their fathers, these two white girls, 12 year old girls' fathers, uh, managed to track down where their daughters were. And they tried breaking into the house where their daughters were. The cops showed up, they arrested the, the dads, they charged them. Then they, they charged the two 12 year old girls for being intoxicated, and then they left to let them keep getting gang raped. I was like, I'm done. I'm done. So, so I decided. All right, this is it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna commit a terrorist attack. I'm done. I'm not putting up with this shit anymore. What am I gonna do? I'm, fuck this. Fine. 
So he went into detail about what specifically made him snap and kill a family, and he uses terms like, I think it was, I can't remember, and, but basically. He murdered people because of a story he kinda knows about. His rant continues on and includes a ton of conspiracies that are not backed up by anything in reality. Unfortunately, this young man was led down a very sad path to the point he murdered an innocent family over nothing. Even as he was charged with first-degree murder, he didn't seem to care according to the officers on the scene. But others cared. They cared a lot. And that was why, over the days that followed, there was an outpouring of grief from all across not only Canada, but the world. As Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau would put it when addressing Parliament soon after the incident, quote, This was a terrorist attack motivated by hatred in the heart of one of our communities. If anyone thinks racism and hatred don't exist in this country, I want to say this. How do we explain such violence to a child in a hospital? How can we look families in the eye and say Islamophobia isn't real? There are no words that can ease the grief of having three generations murdered in their neighborhood. There are no words that can undo the pain and, yes, the anger of this community. There are no words that can fix the future of that little boy who has had his future taken away. He wasn't the only one who was voicing such sentiments either, as Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan would also take to Twitter to both denounce the attack and describe it as yet another example of the growing Islamophobia developing in Western countries. Then, as if that wasn't enough, William Gray, the chief executive at Nathaniel's employer, Gray Ridge Eggs, Inc., went on record as saying that the company was shocked and saddened by the attack and that they had nothing but sympathy for the victim's relatives and for the Muslim community as a whole. Of course, sympathy wasn't going to bring them back, though. Nothing was. No, the only way those who knew the Afsals could get through the situation now was to grieve and honor them in any way they could. That would end up being by not only setting up a fundraising webpage for the surviving son, but also by taking part in a mass vigil at the scene of the crime just two days after it happened. It was an event that had at least in part been set up by the imam of the local London mosque, as he hoped it would be able to raise the spirits of everyone, particularly those who were living in fear that something similar might soon happen to them too. But that wasn't all the vigil was designed to do, of course. No, outside of the obvious honoring of the victims, it also served the purpose of showing the world that Canada and its Muslim community would not stand by and let racism and discrimination run rampant without check. And the thousands who showed up obviously agreed with the latter sentiment, as upon arrival they marched seven kilometers or a little more than four miles from the spot of the murders, all while carrying signs which included messages like, Hate has no home here and Love over hate. As one of the attendees, Ralph Ahmad, put it at the time, quote, I felt very safe when I came here two years ago, but I do not feel safe now. Humanity is first. We should not care about whether someone is a Muslim, a Jew, or a Christian. Obviously, he was happy to see the vigil attended by people of all races and creeds, not just Muslims. And so was 19-year-old college student Abdullah Al-Jarad, another attendee, as he would tell the media, quote, the best part was not just the numbers, but the diversity of the people coming from every single community in London, coming together for this cause. Yes, while it was terrible that it had taken a tragedy like this for it to happen, the event had brought the entire community of London, Ontario together in an act of love and unity, with that being the exact opposite of what Nathaniel Veltman hoped would happen. As the lawyer who would go on to represent the Offsalls put it later, quote, it's almost an act of defiance now to say, you're not going to scare us. If your objective, Veltman, was to instill fear in the hearts and minds of the community, you failed miserably. And he was more aware than most as to what had been lost in the crime as around that same time he'd gotten a call from the principal at Oak Ridge Secondary School where Yumna Afsal had been enrolled. It was during that call that he was informed the school still had a letter the young girl had written to her future self years before one which outlined all of her aspirations in life. Clearly, though, none of those aspirations would be met now. All of that potential was going to be lost into the ether of time. Still, the letter meant a lot to the surviving relatives of Yumna anyway, and that's why the principal wanted to pass it on to them. 
In the letter, it would talk of many things such as the girl's passions for art, hip-hop, and her favorite classes at school, English, and history. Perhaps the most upsetting part, however, came during the section where she talked about her goals. As she wrote, quote, I would describe myself as an ambitious person, so the eagerness and dedication I put into my goals is what drives me to reach them. Although it sounds heavily generic, I have learned that there isn't anything that isn't within our grasp. Truly then, snuffing out the life of such a young girl could only be the work of a monster. But what had led Nathaniel Veltman to that point? What had caused him to be willing to murder a whole family just for the crime of being Muslim? That was the question people now wanted answers to as the day of his trial grew nearer. Had he been spurred on by an association with a far-right group? Well, at least when it came to that question, the answer appeared to be no, as there was no evidence investigators could find that suggested he was a direct member of any such group or had any correspondence with them. But that didn't mean he wasn't inspired by their ideas. To the investigation team, it looked like an open and shut case of yet another angry young man being radicalized. As they saw it, while Nathaniel had always harbored some bigoted beliefs, those had gotten much worse during the lockdown when he started spending more and more time online. And once he was fully in that world of online extremism, he wanted nothing more than to be accepted by his new family of the far right. But his crimes may not have had everything to do with the internet pulling him down that dark rabbit hole, according to Amarnath Amarasingham, an assistant professor of religion and political science at Queen's University who specializes in terrorism and radicalization. He would posit that the attitudes that led to them were actually percolating as far back as Nathaniel's childhood. And that wasn't necessarily because of his parents' fundamentalist beliefs either as, while they may have been against things like abortion, there's no evidence to suggest they were actively racist. According to Professor Amerasingham, it's far more likely the experience of seeing his parents go through a painful divorce was enough to create a cognitive opening in the boy which would make him more susceptible to new ways of thinking. As he put it, quote, I don't think I've ever seen a radicalized case where there wasn't some sort of family turmoil. How did that cognitive opening specifically lead to Nathaniel being radicalized then? Well, after the divorce, it seemed he found solace in the online world. And it was while there he found a community which he thought could offer him support and understanding as they seemed to realize the real reason he was suffering and what the best way to overcome those issues were. Of course, communities like that can be found on the open web, but they can also be found in more extreme forms on the dark web, too. And it looks like it was the dark web where the killer spent most of his time according to information that was gathered from his laptop after the fact. So it's likely he got acquainted with an even more radical and militant version of any ideas he was being given at that point. And in the process of taking these ideas in, he became fully seduced by them. It's even possible he was directly inspired by the work of other terrorists such as the one who carried out a similar attack in Quebec City in 2017 as that attack followed the same general reasoning that Nathaniel's crime had and that was that white culture was under attack from something called the Great Replacement. Basically, this unsubstantiated and erroneous theory puts forward the idea that a white genocide is taking place everywhere in the modern day world we live in. The way it frames things, Caucasians are gradually being pushed out of the gene pool on account of both an increase in interracial relationships and a higher number of people of color immigrating into what were previously predominantly white countries. Understandably then, this theory is widely regarded as not only having no scientific basis, but also being highly racist. Yeah, no shit. That said, for some on the far right, it offers a way of explaining why they're not getting the opportunities they feel they deserve as, according to it, all those opportunities are being taken by people of other ethnicities. So once the folks looking for an answer to their problems in any place they can find it buy into such an idea, it's no surprise they start feeling like something has to be done about the problem at hand. And that's how we arrive at situations where mosques are bombed or black people are shot up in the streets by crazed gunmen. You know, people who are committing violence against people who they claim are violent. It's also probably at least part of the reason we arrived at Nathaniel Veltman murdering four Pakistani Canadian citizens and severely wounding another. After all, to him, they weren't people. 
they were the cause of all of his and his race's problems. He didn't even try to deny that when he was questioned, and he refused to plead insanity too as he didn't want anyone to think his actions had been that of a madman. As to why he had chosen that family particularly out of all of the potential minorities in the area, well, at a certain point during his questioning, that would become clearer. Yes, while it may have indeed been a spur-of-the-moment decision to mount the curb and hit the Afsals with his vehicle, he was always going to attack a Muslim family in the end. He claimed it was retaliation for not only the increase in acts of minority on white crime taking place throughout the world, but also the existence of Muslim child exploitation gangs, two things which are commonly touted as being fact on white nationalist websites despite the overwhelming evidence stating otherwise. In truth, there are no verifiable statistics which show a measurable increase in crime being carried out against white people by minorities. And according to the UK Home Office, there's no credible evidence that any one ethnic group is overrepresented in cases of child sexual exploitation either. In fact, research has found that group's base offenders are most commonly white. Clearly then, that was an out-and-out -out act of terrorism, and as such, not only were charges of first-degree murder warranted, but also charges of committing an act of terrorist violence. The only questions left appeared to be would Nathaniel be convicted when the time came for his trial, and, if he was, given the severity of the charges, how long would he go away for? It might have seemed like those were questions with simple answers, as it was by all accounts an open and shut case. But when it came to sentencing, there was no precedent for such a thing in Canada, as the country had never undergone a murder trial that involved terrorist charges before. No, while terrorism had happened prior to this, it hadn't ever been linked with a case of murder, at least not in court. So, as Nathaniel remained in holding at London's Elgin Middlesex Detention Center, the nation prepared themselves for a truly landmark case, one that would provide a template for how to deal with any incidents that might take place in the future. And that all created such an extreme sense of tension in the air, particularly in London where the incident had occurred, that the presiding judge on the case eventually decided to move the trial to Windsor, Ontario instead as he felt it would be easier to find an impartial jury there. Because of that, the trial was able to get started on September 5th, 2023. Of course, the accused had already admitted his guilt and given the reasons for his actions by now, so trying to claim he was innocent wouldn't do much good. And that was why instead his defense tried to get him a lesser sentence by arguing that his mental state was so poor at the time of the crime, there was no way he could be held accountable for his actions. Something that Nathaniel claimed he wasn't going to try to use. I guess his willingness to sacrifice himself for the cause was short-lived. As his attorney Christopher Hicks put it, his client's mental state had been, quote, a runaway freight train headed for explosion. What he needed wasn't prison. No, what he needed was psychiatric care. And that was an opinion that was furthered by a forensic psychologist, as when called to the stand, she told the jury that Nathaniel had been dealing with several different mental health issues in the lead-up to what he did including, but not limited to, diagnoses of obsessive-compulsive disorder, severe depression, anxiety, and a general personality disorder. As for what had driven the accused over the top on that particular day, well, in the opinion of the doctor, it was his experimentation with magic mushrooms. The prosecution was having none of that nonsense. They argued that any attempt to frame the killer as a victim of his own psychological issues was disrespectful to the dead at best and outright lying at worst. The way they saw it, the only thing that had motivated Nathaniel to hit five people with his truck was hate. Hate which had been fueled by white nationalist ideologies. In the immediate aftermath of the crime, police records even stated he'd described himself as a white nationalist and had said he'd chosen his victims specifically because they were Muslim. And it wasn't like he was in an irrational state of mind and didn't know what he was doing either. With their evidence for that being that Nathaniel had very clearly told police initially arriving at the scene to quote, Come over and arrest me. I did it on purpose. As Fraser Ball, a member of the prosecution team, would tell the court when describing the defendant's actions, quote, It was intended to deliver a brutal message. It was important to him that his actions inspire other white nationalists. 
It was important to him that his brutal message was not just an idle threat from someone trapped in jail. His attack was, in Mr. Veltman's own mind, in his own words, terrorism. It seemed the court agreed with that assessment, especially after the lone remaining member of the family took to the stand himself and described the incident from his own perspective. As Fayez would put it himself when thinking back on how it had affected him, quote, I can't talk to my family anymore and make new memories with them. I won't be able to have fun with them anymore. Me and Yumna had plans that when she finally got her driver's license, she would drive me around. She said it would cost 25 cents per drive. Now I'll never be able to see that. Even when the defense tried to counter by arguing that any statements their client had made prior had been made under duress and so couldn't be taken as truthful, it did no good. No, the reality of the situation was that everyone in the courtroom knew just how important this case was as the eyes of the world were watching to see how they would respond to a serious incident of terrorism. So perhaps that's why it should come as a little surprise that on November 16th, 2023, more than 10 weeks after the trial had begun, the jury came to a decision after just six hours of deliberation. That decision ended up being to find Nathaniel Veltman guilty on four counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. Interestingly, though, they would not find him guilty on terrorism charges as it was felt that charge had not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Still, a guilty verdict was a guilty verdict, and so both those directly affected by the crime and the larger Muslim community were overjoyed by the result in equal measure. In fact, so emotional was the moment, some inside the courtroom were left in tears. Once the media tried to speak to the family of the deceased, the emotion continued to spill over as they communicated their feelings via a prepared statement which read, quote, while this verdict does not bring back our loved ones, it is a recognition by the justice system that the perpetrator of these heinous crimes intended to instill fear and terror in our hearts. This wasn't just an attack on the Muslim community, but rather an attack against the safety and security of all Canadians. This trial and verdict are a reminder there is still much work to be done to address hatred in all forms that lives in our community. Meanwhile, as that was going on, Nathaniel's legal team was making their own statement when they told the press that, quote, It's not clear if terror played any role in the jury's verdict, and the judge may speak about that aspect of the case at the sentencing hearing. The judge can take her own view of the facts. The jury's decision doesn't say whether they found him guilty of first-degree murder according to the criminal code or because of the terrorism allegations. We don't know. We can't ask the jury any questions. We'll see what the judge says at the sentencing hearing. Of course, while they may still have been trying to deny it was an act of terrorism, the vast majority saw it as just that. And the ranks who saw it that way included both Canada's special representative on combating Islamophobia, Amir El Gawabi, and Ontario Premier Doug Ford, each of whom would publicly voice their support for the victims getting justice after the trial was over. And they weren't the only notable public figures who were voicing support either as London Mayor Josh Morgan and the National Council of Canadian Muslims also took to social media to show solidarity with the victims. And in the case of the latter group, they'd even try to dispel the idea that just because the killer wasn't convicted of terrorism, that meant the jury didn't believe terrorist ideals played a role in what he did. As they put it, quote, Judge Pomerantz told jurors they could find the accused guilty of first-degree murder if they agree the attack was planned and deliberate, or if it was a terrorist attack or a combination of the two. Under Canadian law, jury deliberations and the reasons for a verdict are secret, so lawyers and the public will not know how or why the jury came to their decision. They do not need to specify if terrorism was a factor in their decision. On February 22, 2024, after a series of pre-sentencing hearings, the convicted was finally given five life sentences, meaning that Nathaniel is probably going to spend the rest of his days in prison. Though he will be eligible for parole in 25 years, given the public sentiment against him, it seems unlikely he'll get out. Of course, that sentence is about more than just punishing one man, though. It's about sending a message to the very people Nathaniel hoped to inspire. That message is that acts of terrorism committed against either the Muslim community or anyone else will not be tolerated in Canada.
So in that sense, he has had an impact on the larger white nationalist community after all, just not in the way he'd hoped he would. And he's also not managed to strike terror into the hearts of Muslims the way he'd originally intended, because the attack seems to have had the opposite effect in that it's brought people closer together. In fact, in 2022, on the first anniversary of the killings, citizens of London, Ontario would gather en masse at a local sports field next to the school Yumna had attended and held a vigil. That's one of the reasons I feel comfortable telling this story. Some people say that I shouldn't promote Nathaniel's attack as it's just putting his idea in the minds of more people. But the takeaway from this story is much more important. It's that... Despite how certain Nathaniel was that his ideas were common and that people would rise up and continue on with the mission he had started, he was wrong. What his actions truly showed was how uncommon his ideas are and how many people are opposed to the actions he took. That if you choose to kill anyone based on hate, you will be put in a cage like an animal and the world will see you as a monster. There's a few different reasons that for why I did what I did. Uh, reason number one is to send a message to Muslim grooming gangs in the UK that you have to back off, and if you don't back off, uh, more Muslims are going to die. And, they, and there will. Um, because when people like me do things like this, it inspires other angry men to do, this, to do the similar. Like, I would have never done what I did if it wasn't for other men that have done similar things. Um, Brenton Tarrant, the New Zealand shooter, he was a huge inspiration for me. It was like, whoa, a white person actually doing something about Muslim terrorism? Wow! Um, there's other people. There's Anders Brevik, John Ernest. Um, there's lots of people that inspire me to do what I did. And, and now that I did that, whether people like it or not, future people that do the same thing, they will have been inspired, be, been inspired by me. It will accelerate. So pe there will be people down the road who decide to do something similar to what I did, and it will be me, I'll be one of the people that gave them inspiration. Sorry, Nathaniel, you're not inspiring anybody. As Hina and Ali Islam, two extended family members of the deceased, put it when later interviewed by CBC News in Canada, quote, The killer tried to divide us, to isolate Muslims. That was his intention, and what I saw instead was humanity coming out. People from different colors, faiths, walks of life, hugging us, coming to support us. I hope we can take that momentum and continue it forward. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.